Schwing, ring, kling, ein Saum. Ing, ring, schwing, ka e i la ring. Ha sa ka ha la ring, sa ka la ring. Sao ein kling, ring, schwing. Aum. Namaste. Well, this is one of those things that's really hard to talk about. But I feel a need to share it, and especially along with the music that I'm releasing. I got the inspiration to do another recording of Mahasodashi Mantra. And this one came out quite different, very unique style. You heard it in the introduction to this video. So yesterday, or in the process of developing this piece, I was listening to it a lot. I mean a lot, hours. Huh? I wanted to make a recording of the mantra that is so perfect that even someone like me who is very critical could listen to it for hours and hours during meditation and not get tired of it. And also so it would be pleasing to the goddess. So this is the hard part. <laughs> After listening to this for hours and hours in meditation, early this morning, just before awakening, I had not one, but two dreams in which the goddess revealed herself completely. And, you know, this is a big deal. Back in 1984, when I first encountered her, she remained invisible. She didn't manifest. But she certainly had an effect on me just by, you know, pushing on my third eye, boom. <laughs> They say first path is the big one, you know, because it completely uh, opens up the path to Brahman, to Nirvana. But I don't know, this is pretty big too. When the goddess reveals her personal form in completeness, I mean, this is, this, is there any higher blessing? Is there any, any greater uh, favor that she could give someone? I don't think so. This whole day, I've been just thinking about it, feeling the energy, the mood, the extraordinary mood of beauty and love, just like a, a river of beauty, huh? A river of love coming from her and you know I, I kind of don't know what to make of it but it's great <laughs> my inquiry into Sri Vidya started about two and a half years ago and I was reading the books of uh, a great Indian saint and master and a Param Guru, Paramacharya, Sri Chandrasekhar Indra Saraswati, Periyava or Mahaperiyava. I'm going to do a separate video on him alone because he's a very interesting person. But anyway, he recommended this Sri Vidya worship of goddess Kamakshi. And so you've seen her picture many times on our videos. And at that time I was wrestling with the contents of the teaching because, okay, I had given the Advaita teaching as taught by Ramana Maharshi. But I could tell from the response that it was way over people's heads. And if they got it at all, they got it on the level of Neo-Advaita. 
And of course, Neo Advaita tries to make a shortcut that avoids karma yoga and bhakti yoga and just goes straight to meditation. And of course, it usually fails. <laughs> so I was very concerned. I was looking for a teaching on the karma yoga and bhakti yoga level that I could offer to my viewers that would be good for them. And that wouldn't involve them in any kind of sectarian activities. You know, that would just be helpful to prepare their foundation for meditation later on. So I started looking into this Sri Vidya and one thing led to another. I took initiation. Uh, I got the Nam initiation, uh, you know, the uh, Atma Bija and then initiation into the Bala Mantra, Siddha Mantra, and finally Maha Sodashi Mantra. And all was going along quite well. And then I met my guru, my sannyas guru. And he's also a Shakta. Huh? He had long hair, much longer than mine. <laughs> and uh, he was very old. But he came to my house and blessed my house three times in three years. Every time I moved, he'd come again. Finally, he got so old, he couldn't go anywhere. And then I knew he was about to leave the world. So I approached him and I begged him for sannyas and he gave it immediately without any hesitation. <laughs> so then I wandered for several months going way up in Nepal and Himalayas and like that. But when I came back and he was very sick and, you know, not eating and like that. So he left his body in, it'll be two years ago in just a few days from now. And that, his death was so beautiful. I mean, just amazing. And after he left the body, I found him uh, way, way up in highest, highest realms. So this was very impressive. And I said, all right, I'm going to really get into this. So then I made a whole bunch of video series about the mother and the matrika and the different ceremonies and mantras. And well, you can look in the playlists and you can see all the series that I did. Meanwhile, I was practicing it myself you know, as my own personal bhakti, because my experience with bhakti goes way back to the Hare Krishna movement. And in the Hare Krishnas, it's supposed to be about conjugal love, rasa, with Krishna. But wait a minute, Krishna is a male. So are we talking about, you know, transsexualism, spiritual transsexualism, or what is this? You know, nobody would explain it or could explain it to me satisfactorily. And I continued to experiment with it, but it, it really wasn't working for me. And that's when I dropped it and went into Buddhism, or actually Buddha's teaching. I don't recognize Buddhism. I don't think it's a valid religion because it's built on a corruption of the Buddha's teaching. I go back to the original sutras, like my Buddhist guru. <laughs> then he's also a Vedantist. So the uh, union of Buddha's teaching and Vedanta was very apparent to him. And then he opened all that up to me, Bhikkhunyanananda. Uh, and uh, he's also passed away now. Then I started moving into Sri Vidya seriously. And this brought up again this concept of the rasa of conjugal love. And as we've spoken of here several times, that Ultimately, each of us is Brahman. Each of us is Shiva. Each of us is the consort of the goddess. 
So again, the possibility of conjugal love, uh, romantic love between Shiva and Shakti comes up. So this, this again builds a bridge between Bhakti and Advaita. So there's no need for them to be considered separate at all. So anyway, my practice has been going along more or less smoothly. <laughs> there have been long stretches where I couldn't discern anything was happening. And then all of a sudden I'll have some extraordinary inner realization or experience. So, you know, that's just the way it is on sadhana. But then last night, I had not one, but two dreams right in a row. And the first one woke me up. Wow, you know. And then the second one really woke me up. And I was just, just floored. But you see, this is the reciprocation between the Divine Mother and her devotee. She is not insentient or abstract or imaginary or any of the things the so-called rationalists like to talk about. No, she's real. She's real on a certain level, on the dream level and the causal level. She is absolutely real and active and very personal in her dealings with her devotees. So anyway, I'm not going to get into the details of this experience because it was just too personal, too intimate. And, you know, I don't want to offend her. I want her to come back tonight. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But um, she does what she wants, you know. She's not subject to anybody's will, not even Shiva. <laughs> But she is definitely reciprocating with those who love her on an equal level. In other words, the more you love her, the more she reciprocates. The more she'll take care of you from within. The more you'll be freed from cravings for mundane enjoyment and mundane love and false relationships like that. And the more you will come into awareness of your true identity, uh, which is really who you are, who you've always been, and who you always will be. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti, Aum.